Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Christine Greco. I'm the acting chief of the Division of Pain Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, today, we will be talking about our approach uh, to treating pain uh, in children of all ages at, um, our, in our division. Um, I'd like to ask each of my colleagues on the panel today to introduce themselves. Neil, maybe you can start with yourself. Sure, my name is Neil Schechter and I'm the director of the Chronic Pain Clinic here. I'm a developmental pediatrician by training and I've been doing chronic pain work for many, many, many years. <laughs> and Deirdre, do you wanna join? Yeah, good morning, I'm Deirdre Logan. I'm the director of psychology services across all of our pain programs in the Division of Pain Medicine. Um, Feels like I've been doing chronic pain for a long time, maybe not quite as long as Neil, but it's been a while. And Dr. Dinakar. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Pradeep Dinakar. I'm the director of the interventional pain service at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and I do have a joint appointment with uh, Mass General Brigham um, in Boston. So I'd like to begin by um, asking Neil, um, if you could talk a little bit about what we've learned about chronic pain the management and how we incorporate that into our chronic pain clinic. Well, thanks, thanks, Chris, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, um, so we have learned an awful lot about chronic pain in the past twenty years or so, and and we've tried to really incorporate a lot of that into what we do at our clinic. But I want to spend some time just talking about it, some basic principles that that have emerged. <clears throat> the first that many of you are aware of is that that chronic pain is very, very different than acute pain. Acute pain is the model that most of us live with, that there is some sort of tissue damage. Uh, that tissue damage creates a pain signal, if you will, that's interpreted in the brain, and we react in a certain way. And when that tissue damage heals gradually over a period of time, the pain gradually goes away. So the focus of acute pain is really to look at the source of that tissue damage and do what we can about it. That model doesn't work at all. That's the traditional medical model. And that does not work at all when we're dealing with chronic pain, when we're dealing with widespread musculoskeletal pain or persistent daily headache or abdominal pain. Um, because if we try that model, we end up with some significant investigation on and on, extensive investigation. And then when we don't find any tissue damage, which is usually the situation, then we refer that patient typically, dichotomize that and refer that patient to a mental health professional. And that leaves both the physician, the family, the child, all very unsatisfied. Because what we've learned now is that that's an inaccurate understanding of what's going on in chronic pain. What seems to be happening in chronic pain is that it's a biopsychosocial phenomena. That is, that, um, that, that basically what we have is a, a biologically or pain vulnerable individual for some reason or other, whether that be genetics, whether that be early adversity or temperament or anxiety or hypermobility or any a, a number of factors that create a vulnerability in an individual. And then what, and that yields to what was no, now known as central sensitization. And what then happens in a centrally sensitized individual is that there is a triggering event. And that event can be COVID, that event can be Lyme, that event can be any number of infectious processes, that event can be a trauma, uh, physical or psychological, sur surgery, any number of things can trigger the onset of what are known as primary pain disorders, which are the main thing that we're talking about today. That is the persistence of pain in the nervous system. And what that is about is not a tissue damage issue, but in fact, that the nerves themselves have become hypersensitive. In fact, there's what we refer to as a glitch, a computer glitch in the software, and not a hardware problem, but a software problem. So all the searching for hardware that we want to do, we don't typically find a hardware problem. There are some hardware triggers that we'll talk about, but most of the time we don't. So we learned that, and that's critically important. The other thing we've learned that we incorporate into our treatment is that these problems typically co-occur. So for example, in about 40% of the time in our GI pain program, somebody else has a headache or widespread musculoskeletal pain. So very commonly, someone will have seen a neurologist for their headache, a gastroenterologist for their GI upset, a rheumatologist for their, their um, uh, widespread musculoskeletal pain. And each will have had given them a suggestion about what's going on, but the integration of all this typically doesn't occur, and that's what we've learned is important in our chronic pain clinic. And that's what we emphasize as a part of our treatment. 
Additionally, we've learned besides the sort of co-occurrence of these problems so that it makes sense to families when we describe it as the nerves are hypersensitive as though they're sunburned in a way is another metaphor that we use. Um, but another thing that we've learned is that there are often associated symptoms that go along with this. Uh, orthostatic intolerance of one sort or another, dizziness, insomnia, mental clouding, anxiety, depression, um, uh, dizziness, all kinds of symptoms that go along with this. And unless we address some of those symptoms, we're really not addressing the, the, the whole child, which is the, 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 and that's who is experiencing all of this suffering. So uh, what we do again, as a part of our program is very much focus on the, the kind of broad, co the broader context, not only of the pain itself, but the associated symptoms. Additionally, we now find that there are uh, a number of syndromes if you will, that have become associated with chronic pain. Uh, and you all are familiar with them uh, who take care of this, uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and, and MALS and, uh, and abdominal cutaneous nerve entrapment and um, perhaps mast cell activation disorder, any number of these conditions. And those conditions we perceive are triggers if you will, in an underlying sensitized nervous system. So we look at those problems and we would address them if they exist, but we see them again as only a part of a complicated problem. The addressing those single, single uh, problems do not, does not address the overall sort of issue. Okay, and finally, let me just move on to treatment for just a minute or two. And um, uh, again, we perceive the treatment, as I mentioned, as a biopsychosocial approach, and that's the thrust of this whole seminar that we have this morning. And, um, and what we know about treatment is that um, it takes a village for many of these sort of situations because they're not only one thing or another thing and we have to look at the broader context of the whole child. So for example, we see certain treatments as very uh, general um, and they seem to work for all chronic pains. Those are cognitive behavioral strategies, for example, that Dr. Logan is an expert in and she will be talking about them as soon as I, I finish. Uh, um, so that's one thing that works for all chronic pain. We know, for example, that physical activity uh, is important and physical therapy is often critical for this. And that's why, like Dr. Logan and a psychologist is always involved in our chronic pain clinic, very often, at least until we went to a hybrid model, a, a, a physical therapist was always involved in this as well, um, to look at that piece. And finally, we know that other things are important. So medications are important that are generally important. Some of the antidepressants, anticonvulsants, um, non-steroidals generally are helpful for these conditions. Not 100% by far, and we can get into that if there are discussions later, but, but those are things that are generally, generally helpful. And finally, in terms of what's generally helpful, we know that the feedback session itself is very important. The relationship that families have with the person, the people providing their care. And so we, spend an inordinate amount of time helping families understand using metaphors and a variety of things what we perceive as going on. But there also are some specific treatments as well to deal with the triggers. There might be an inflamed nerve or an irritated nerve. There might be a muscle that's in spasm. There might be a time we want to put um, do a pain interruption. And for that, we have the great fortune in our program of having a pain intervention service as well that Dr. Dinikar leads and has a, an able group of colleagues who, who participate. So that's kind of the overall background that I wanted to mention of how we think about pain in our clinic. Um, Dr. Logan, do you want to talk a little bit about the psychological interventions that might be that we typically think about and use? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so as Neil said, you know, one of the hallmarks of this kind of an effective approach really is, um, you know, having everyone at the table from the very beginning. So the moment the family comes to our clinic, uh, you know, they're seeing psychology hand in hand with our physician team and hopefully also physical therapy. Um, and as Neil mentioned, the reason for that is we don't wanna be working something up medically and then not finding a clear answer. And then you tell them, well, it must be a psychological problem. So we really work hard to help people understand uh, that any pain condition, there's always a brain-based element of that. So in our initial assessment, um, part of what we're doing is looking for some of those vulnerability factors that Neil mentioned that might be more in the mental health realm. So anxiety, depression, which may have predated the pain, may have arisen as a result of living with chronic pain, 
Um, you know, it, it, to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter. We just wanna understand uh, the kid that's with us now and what they're dealing with and, and what we can help intervene with. Uh, so that's a piece of our assessment. Uh, we may also, in that initial assessment, really wanna understand how pain has affected them. So that functional disability piece, what are they not doing that they used to do? That's of interest to our whole team, but particularly psychology. Often we may build kind of exposure-based sorts of treatments to help them get over any fears or other hurdles more psychologically that are, that are keeping them from doing those things. Um, and we're thinking in that first assessment about what kinds of psychological approaches may be a good match for any particular kid. We have a range of tools that we can draw from uh, and a different package is gonna work differently uh, for an individual kid and an individual family. So we try to understand what might be most effective for any given kid in that initial assessment. Um, from there, when we are working more in treatment with kids, um, much of what we do can be categorized as cognitive behavioral therapy. We're really working um, to kind of provide skills and address behavioral issues. We're working on the thoughts and feelings that go along with chronic pain. So uh, if a kid is really engaging in a lot of hopeless, negative thinking around the pain, that thinking itself may in turn amplify the experience of the pain. So we're gonna take some cognitive behavioral approaches to trying to modify those thoughts. Um, as I mentioned, we may build exposure in. So if a kid is really avoiding activities, um, we're gonna help find a way to gradually get them back and comfortable doing those activities. One area where that really comes out with a lot of kids we see is in school functioning. We see a lot of kids who maybe aren't going to school at all or are missing a lot of school because of pain. So we may work to really slowly build a plan to get them back in school, um, hand in hand with their school personnel. We'll reach out and collaborate and really try to address that um, and that's a model of kind of how we would work on those kinds of issues. Uh, and then there's a, a whole host of skills that we're teaching kids. So relaxation strategies, um, using breathing techniques, imagery, uh, muscle relaxation, lots of strategies that are aimed at kind of calming down the nervous system. Um, because again, most of these conditions really are about a, a hyperactive nervous system. And if we can teach kids that they can do things that will help to calm them down, um, those strategies are effective and having kids believe that there are things they can do and have some control over the situation can also be really effective. At times we'll also draw from other kinds of, of tools and approaches. So mindfulness, acceptance and commitment kinds of treatments sometimes are more effective if you have a kid who says, look, I've tried all that. None of those skills work. What do I do now? Then we might shift and, and kind of focus on what's important to them and how they wanna live a life that's meaningful, even if they don't feel like they can directly reduce what their experience is. Uh, sometimes we'll draw on biofeedback training, which sometimes is less threatening than talking to a psychologist. You can hook up to a computer and use some interventions there and really see what's working and, and how your body is responding. So again, these are all strategies we can draw from and we'll tailor a treatment um, to what kids and families uh, need. We'll also tailor how they get that treatment. So we have individual psychology sessions where we'll work one-on-one -on -one with kids and families. We have some brief treatment packages, often in a group uh, kind of basis, like our comfortability program. And at times for some of our most impaired kids, uh, we have an intensive day treatment program, which really is an interdisciplinary program where psychologists and physical therapists and occupational therapists work along with physicians and nurses and kids are there every day. And we can circle back and talk about that more if that's of interest later. Um, so that's a bit on kind of how we approach these things from psychology. Great, thank you, Deidre. Um, Pradeep, do you want to talk about how interventional um, procedures can have a role in the treatment of chronic pain? Uh, absolutely, um, Chris, thank you. So um, uh, that was a great description of our core practice of um, uh, pediatric pain with Dr. Schechter and Dr. Logan. Um, as you can see how um, even in this webinar here, uh, we have a multidisciplinary group, and this is how um, we sort of approach patients. Dr. Schechter is a developmental pediatrician, um, Dr. Logan is a psychologist, Dr. Craig is an anesthesiologist, and I'm a neurologist by background. So if we all get on the same table and look at a patient, we look at them differently. And, and that's quite helpful. And at Boston Children's, we sort of love to push this, um, push our boundaries to see what more can we bring to the table for this patient. Um, Right, if these multidisciplinary approaches have to work, if there are easily treatable causes or, or fixable causes, uh, we wanna be able to help them because as a neurologist, I understand um, the less amount of pain the nervous system has to deal, the better it responds to the modalities we, we uh, put at it. So one of the things um, which uh, we have a deep learning um, in the adult side um, is interventional approaches to management of pain. And, and given my background on the adult side uh, at the Mass General in Brigham, 
uh, one of my goals was to bring um, some of these interventional techniques for similar problems in the pediatric and the young adult side. Um, even though all patients don't fit this profile, there is a, a subset of patients in each of these uh, pain categories who actually fit this profile. And when you combine this with our um, uh, multidisciplinary approach, um, it really reduces their pain burden. And, and many of these techniques tend to work better. Um, we use this in the form of uh, nerve blocks, uh, in the form of uh, joint injections, um, uh, in the form of um, radio frequency lesionings. Um, uh, we use um, this in an outpatient setting and also in an inpatient setting. Um, in patients with refractory pain, for example, we could uh, place a catheter uh, and, and run local anesthetic and block and break that pain cycle for an extended period of time so the nervous system resets itself. So there is a, a lot of opportunities that, that we have. And given that this is a very unique uh, way of approaching a, a part of pediatric pain, um, we have taken it upon our, ourselves to study these and, and provide outcomes so we have a robust body of evidence which, which other hospitals can follow. So that, that in, in a sense is what this program does. We can go into specifics with the cases. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to, um, next, I thought it'd be helpful to have, uh, present a few cases, and then each of you can sort of um, present your piece and how you would manage uh, this type of patient. So I'll, I'll begin with a first case. Um, it's something we see very common in our, um, in our clinic, um, a 16 year old athlete who uh, injured his ACL playing soccer. Um, he had an ACL repair months ago, um, but uh, continues to have pain uh, in his knee, despite the surgeon's feeling that the surgical repair was, was quite, quite good and there were no structural orthopedic problems. Um, he has uh, continued to have constant knee pain. He's developed headaches. He is not sleeping well. And mom feels he's really become sort of isolated from his social group of, uh, of team soccer players. Um, and so maybe Neil, you could begin by talking a little bit about how you would sort of work up and, and manage this type of a patient. Sure. And again, as you suggested, Chris, that is a common, a common uh, scenario that we will see. You know, very often people's lives are dramatically changed by what seems to be a sort of a relatively minor injury or, or a situation in which we would think that they would bounce back and yet they don't. And, and again, along the lines of what I said before, we would see evaluate this as, as a child or as an individual who probably had some sort of pain vulnerability for one reason or another. Um, and um, we'd explore what that possibly was. That doesn't change anything dramatically if they're vulnerable, but, but it lets us, gives us context. We then, um, for the most part, examine that knee and see if, for example, there was something very local that we could do from a an interventional point of view. But before we would get to that, we would typically reinforce the critical importance of physical therapy, the critical importance of, of sort of return to school using the techniques that, that Deirdre has already elucidated. And for my purposes, we would start with some local some local treatments. For example, we might try on that knee, uh, any, a lidoderm patch or uh, diclofenac gel or something along those lines. We might use something systemic to see if we can quiet down that hypersensitive nerve. But the most important thing that I would do to this would be to explain to the child that this is common, not to worry about it, that the outcomes tend to be, we're optimistic about positive outcomes for this. We emphasize that from the beginning, that this is not a mystery. It's not surprising. It's not unique. Uh, and he may be a unique individual and a wonderful individual, but it's not unique in our practice. And that these are conditions that will improve given a rehab model, which is what we want to emphasize. And then we would try to engage them with uh, Dr. Logan in physical therapy. And then um, I'll let Pradeep talk about what, what he might bring to the table next. I don't know if Dr. Deirdre, do you want to discuss what you would do with this sort of theoretical patient? Absolutely. So one of the advantages of being in this integrated team setting as, as a psychologist, I can talk to my colleagues and really understand, you know, are there physical limitations to what this kid can and can't do? Or is a lot of it kind of a, a learned avoidance at this point? Um, and once I understood that, it would be a goal to work with a patient like this on, you know, if you're really missing playing soccer, are there ways you can slowly get back to that? Um, or if you 
want to find new activities? Could we work on sort of having other outlets so that that piece of isolation that Chris mentioned this, this kid feeling and um, probably their identity as an athlete, um, if we could sort of help them kind of recapture some of, of the connections and the, the sense of self-worth that they had in those activities, that would be a real goal of treatment. As Neil mentioned, we would maybe develop a plan to increase school attendance, helping to identify, you know, what are some of the hurdles? What makes it hard to be in school? Is it, you know, do you have classes that involve a lot of up and down stairs? Well, is there a way that we can kind of reorganize things? Um, reaching out to the school to try to put some accommodations in place, not going overboard because we don't always want to send the message that you have a lifelong, really important problem that we're going to have to, you know, modify around all the time, but some short term accommodations to help a kid feel more comfortable in their day to day settings. And then, as I mentioned before, trying to equip the, the patient with a set of skills that they can use. So if something is hard to do and does feel painful, what can you do to kind of help calm yourself down and, and feel like you have some skills to manage this? So learning behavioral strategies and addressing um, some of the thoughts and worries that go along with that. And we would, of course, also be working closely with other family members. Even with an adolescent, we would um, try to keep parents in the loop and try to understand how the pain has maybe reshaped things at home and how people are responding around pain. Oftentimes we'll see that kids, you know, aren't doing any of their share of chores around the house anymore. And that was adaptive for a while, but now it kind of constantly resends this message that you are different and you have this problem and we all have to kind of reshape life. So we would try to undo some of that in, in ways that really support the patient and help them feel gradually like they can get back to functioning. Thank right. you, Deidre. And Pradeep, you can um, maybe add some thoughts about interventional aspects for this patient. Uh, absolutely. So, so the goal on the intervention side for a patient like this, uh, which is actually not uncommon at all, it's, it's quite common, um, is I, I view this in a way as do I add value when I get involved or can I make it worse? You know, that, that is my primary question. Um, is this pain situation, um, you know, focused just on the knee or is this part of an overall problem, which we should probably deal with in a more multidisciplinary way? Uh, once, um, you know, I have Dr. Schechter and Dr. Logan sort of, uh, you know, uh, help me with that understanding. Um, it, the goal then becomes, how do I reduce this pain burden in this patient? Can I do something focal, something locally in the knee or in the leg even to help? So um, good examples of things you can intervene uh, would be, let's say, if this is an irritation of the knee joint itself, would probably uh, an, an intraarticular cortisone injection make a difference? Um, would intraarticular synvisc or hyaluronidase make a difference? So those are local um, injections. If this is a more diffuse pain around the knee joint just from the sensitivity, because this is a pain vulnerable kid and, and, and psychology, uh, physical therapy are, are actively working on, might be I could do something like a genicular nerve block, which is basically blocking all the sensory nerves. There are five nerves around the knee which through which the knee feels pain. If I block that, would I basically turn the switch off for an uh, for an extended period of time? And when it comes back on, probably the nervous system works a little better. And, and of course, the patient appreciates that break in pain. Um, if this sort of tends to work, if that thought process tends to work, um, we also have options of placing um, both inpatient and outpatient catheters, uh, which can actually block the entire knee and leg uh, for for extended period of time for days, and and some of these patients could actually go home on one of these um, home catheters, and we do have um, uh, excellent experience and specialization in this, uh, to the point where we started doing this initially for for pain managing pain postoperatively in, in a chronic pain setting, but now it is almost coming into uh, the the main line of management of. Uh, you know, all post-operative knee pains and the surgeon's feedback is they prescribe so much less opioids with, um, with something like this for every post-operative catheter. So, so these techniques do have not just a bearing on chronic pain, but also on management of acute post-operative pain. So. Thank you, Pradeep. I'm going to um, go on to our second case. Um, the uh, case number two is another common scenario that we see frequently in our, in our pain clinic. This is a 15 year old female who has a history of constipation um, and she uh, was referred after an extensive GI workup for diffuse abdominal pain. Um, there was no clear etiology from her GI workup. 
Um, her symptoms include constant pain, um, nausea, fatigue. She has difficulty sleeping at night because of her symptoms and she's had significant school absenteeism. Um, Neil, do you wanna begin with your approach to managing this patient? Sure, and, and again, as Chris suggested, this is something we're seeing more and more and more of as well. Um, we do have at our institution the, the, the benefit of, of a gastroenterologist who's actively involved with us in addressing these kinds of problems, who has a similar model to us in terms of thinking about triggers and, and the source of pain as well. So, so that's very, very beneficial. But in general, for a patient like this, we would perceive that the constipation is a trigger. It's not the cause of the problem. The problem is that the nerves themselves are hypersensitive um, and that individual uh, is, has an overreactive, if you will, in the parts of the brain that sense these things are in fMRI work that we've actually done uh, are actually enlarged the parts of the brain that, that experience that. Likewise, the parts of the brain that are, make awareness of that are also enlarged. And so the patient is often aware of that discomfort in addition to experiencing it more intensely. So our, our job with them is to number one, explain it just the same way we're talking about right now. And in, in fact, in our abdominal pain clinic, we have studied and actually asked patients when they came back for a second visit, what was the most helpful thing about our visit? And they'll typically say it was the explanation that I got, that, that I'm not making this up, that it's that you believe me that it's a real problem and that I now understand what are now called, these disorders are now called disorders of gut-brain interaction. D, let's see, D, uh, G, B, I's. Uh, and that's the sort of new terminology instead of sort of functional problems. Um, anyway, our approach to that would be very similar to the others. We would use the, some of the psychological strategies that are very effective for this in terms of getting that individual back to school. We'd strongly consider not only addressing specific kinds of problems like some of the issues around, uh, around the uh, constipation, but we'd use some of the more general approaches. Uh, physical therapy very typically is very helpful for these patients who tend to be uh, couch bound. We typically would use um, some of the specific the general medications that we talked about before, amitriptyline, for example, or gabapentin, and there's some literature on that. Um, we'd address the nausea, and there's a number of agents that are now available for nausea. Something we use a lot of is called IB Guard or FB Guard, which are peppermint oil preparations, and that's, those are also very effective. And again, we'd work very much on looking at this child's life and getting them moving and going again. Uh, Dr. Logan, do you wanna take it from there? Sure. Um, one of the things we might work on with a patient like this, or really lots of different kinds of patients, is helping them to understand the connections between stress and pain, sort of psychological kinds of stress and pain. And it's important to do that in a way that doesn't, you know, come across as, as labeling the pain itself as a psychological problem. But again, in this model of disorders of brain-gut interaction, helping them really understand that things that are going on around them, stresses that they experience, really can influence their physical symptoms and physical symptoms can be a response to that stress. So we might help them kind of think through how does your body respond to stress and what do you see and what are common stresses that you're dealing with and then help them kind of develop more adaptive approaches to managing that stress. And again, that's where you pull in some of the um, relaxation, other kinds of behavioral techniques, but really um, helping kids to be able to see that connection and see what their kind of stress triggers are and having a plan for dealing with that. Another important thing I would address in this case, uh, Chris mentioned that sleep has really been affected and we see that quite a lot in a chronic pain population that kids are sleeping really poorly and there are a number of behavioral strategies for helping with sleep that we will often draw upon uh, to help them improve that with the idea that if they can get better sleep that may be sort of a protective factor that can help them um, work on their pain issues as well. So that might be another piece we would address through kind of a cognitive behavioral sleep <laughs> approach. And if I could just mention one more thing, uh, that we would do an exam on this patient, and if and during that exam we find a very localized, a kind of localized area that uh, that the child's experiencing discomfort, and in addition to the broader sorts of issues, we might think that something else is going on, and then we would call our colleague Pradeep to take a look uh, at what he could bring to that table, to the table. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. So. Um... So neurologically, when, when you sort of see somebody with a more diffuse pain, well, you know, even though it is challenging to treat, 
um, it, it probably always, you know, for the most part started at one point in, in some place. And, and many times you're not able to identify this. And that's, that's the, the big problem in management. But sometimes like Neil had mentioned, there is, there are focus of pain still firing away. And it almost, it's maintaining the whole pain cycle and the brain gut uh, sort of takes it from there and creates all these other GI symptoms. And if you have some sort of a focal area that you could treat, and one example that, um, you know, Neil, myself, the GI folks, the general surgeons have worked on to create one of the largest studies uh, is an abdominal cutaneous nerve entrapment situation where um, you find the cause of abdominal pain is more musculoskeletal uh, with trigger points and nerve entrapments as opposed to any uh, intra-abdominal problems. So clearly, this could be identified very easily with a simple exam. Just the knowledge of this is all what is needed. And this could probably prevent multiple unnecessary scopes and, and, and surgeries like appendectomies or exploratory laparotomies and, and, and you know, cholecystectomies. And, and we've seen that. So, I mean, it, 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 over the last about decade or more, we've sort of, you know, educated everybody who sees abdominal pains that they should you know, not miss something like this because we could fix these um, reasonably uh, easily compared to the diffuse pain. Um, an ultrasound guided uh, transverse abdominus plane block or trigger point injection of the rectus abdominis um, really works well as long as the patient is identified correctly and you could actually see some abnormality. We could go in there and, and with the volume of local anesthetic and steroid we inject, we could disentrap these nerves. Uh, we found this not only be effective for the pain symptoms, but sometimes with improvement in pain, the brain gut connection sort of calms down and some of the GI symptoms improve. Um, and again, these do recur and sometimes uh, repeat injections are needed, but we've not seen somebody needing indefinite number of uh, injections. And, and finally, those who, um, the way we look at these blocks and the blocks are not only therapeutic, they're also diagnostic. So when I place that block right on that muzzle and if their whole pain settles down, uh, it is diagnostic. I don't have to look for other causes. So that's, that's very important. But sometimes these blocks are diagnostic but not therapeutic because there is probably um, a nerve which has been damaged or uh, necrosed. Um, we do have our surgical colleagues uh, who can sort of help in those situations with some disentrapments. Um, and yes, so there are many, 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 many invasive options which are available for more focal type of pains, not the diffuse as much. And I think, as you said, I, we should point out that, you know, they often coexist where you have diffuse yeah. pain, but you also have a very localized area of tenderness that can be a, a nerve entrapment. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. I, I'm, I think we have time for just one more case. Um, um, we've covered a lot of the material, um, and this is also another common scenario that we see in our pain clinic. This is a 17-year-old uh, female who had an ankle sprain uh, many months ago, um, and she has progressed to just persistent limb pain uh, despite extensive courses of physical therapy, um, long-term cognitive behavioral therapy. She's still wearing a boot the majority of the time after about eight or nine months. Um, like the others, she's had um, difficulty getting to school. She's progressed to having diffuse body pains um, and things have been just very incapacitating for her. Um, so Dr. Schechter, maybe you could start by uh, explaining how you would manage someone who's had sort of extensive treatment um, and is not sort of going in the right trajectory. Yeah, um, so to put that in context, I would say perhaps um, 85 to 90% of the children, we see maybe even a higher percentage than that, respond to a an, an intensified sort of outpatient program where PT a couple times a week and, and as well as cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as some of the medications, as well as uh, our attempts at, at making their lives a lot better by providing accommodations for school and helping with sleep and whatever. Mo most individuals we see do respond to that. However, there are a subgroup who do not. And despite all of the medications that we can offer despite all the intensification that we can do on an outpatient uh, basis, it becomes very difficult to, to uh, address them and their suffering persists. And um, these are individuals who might've had a block or two 
for one reason or another and, and had limited success. They have complex regional pain syndrome, they have any number of things, but stay with this particular patient. They have developed a widespread pain, chronic pain syndrome really. Um, what, um, and uh, as a result of that, we try a couple of other things. Something that we have tried at our institution, for example, for somebody like this would be a lidocaine infusion, which is something a bit more aggressive if they really haven't been successful with all of these other interventions. But if in fact, we have tried all of these things and they're still struggling and the parents are really struggling and we put things in place, then we tend to think about a more intensive rehabilitation model. And, um, and that works for, as I mentioned, perhaps it's necessary for about 5% of our population. And Dr. Logan is the director of psychology actually at the pain rehab program that we, we offer here. And it's one of uh, perhaps five or 10 in the country or so that have different sorts of models, but all basically emphasize the same sort of thing, an aggressive, intensive, an intensive physical therapy, occupational therapy, recreational therapy, and psychotherapeutic approaches. And uh, I'll let her talk about the program, but that's, I think, would be the next logical step for us. Once we've done all we could in terms of the relationship, help the family as best we could, then perhaps it needs a more intensive level of care. Yeah, absolutely. And our program in particular is a, a day hospital model. So kids are coming, you know, at eight in the morning and they're there all day going through both individual therapies and physical therapy, occupational therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and some group therapy experiences um, with, again, physician and, and nurses there as well to manage any medication or physical issues. Um, one of the hallmarks of that kind of approach is how closely the team really works together. So once a kid, you know, we've identified the goals to work on with a kid, the therapists are really in close contact throughout the day, kind of reporting how a kid does in one hour, and that kind of informs the next clinician's approach. So the, the, the psychological piece is really very closely integrated with the, the physical and occupational therapy interventions. Um, the same sort of sets of skills are used. We also take a really family-oriented approach in our program. So, um, you know, we want the kids to be there and be independent much of the time, but we also are not forgetting that these kids are going to leave this program in a few weeks and go back to their, their systems at home. And we really work to make sure families are thinking through and understanding the kinds of changes um, that we're asking the kids to make as well uh, so that the system supports those changes. One thing that's really important about that intensive approach um, is that kids really and families need to understand up front. It is a program that focuses on restoring function. Uh, so one of the times we struggle is when families come and say, okay, we're gonna go into this program for a few weeks and then the pain will be all gone. That's often not the outcome. The outcome is often that the pain is less intense, but most importantly, that function has improved. So kids that were playing a sport can be getting their way back into that sport. Kids who weren't able to go to school are going to school. Um, and it's really key that families understand that's what we're working on. Um, and that there's a lot of work that we are asking these kids to do. It's not a passive program. Um, the kids really need to buy in and jump in and engage in the work to make it successful. Um, but when they do, it, it really has tremendous outcomes and it's really impressive to watch how much they can progress in a few weeks of that kind of intensive integrated treatment. That's great, thank you. Uh, I thought it would be a good time to go to some of the questions uh, that came in ahead of time. Um, also, um, please feel free to put some of the questions into the um, Q&A and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, I, I'm gonna start with the first question that came in ahead of time. And Neil, this might be a, a good question for you. Um, have there been any recent developments in the management of pain for children with chronic conditions? And if so, what are they? And what are some of the benefits and adverse effects? Yeah, that's a very important question uh, because what we now know is you can have <clears throat> inflammatory bowel disease, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, uh, any number of chronic conditions that are under control, the inflammatory markers are down, it looks like the disease is under control, yet the pain associated with it persists. And, and we now realize that we can have functional abdominal pain in, in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease. So, um, so we treat those kinds of conditions exactly as though they were the, the way we would treat them if they didn't have an underlying ear, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, for example. And that is with a rehabilitative approach of biopsychosocial model. And, um, and we recognize that there might be more entrenched some of those problems. There's a little more anxiety about that. Well, maybe this is a sub, su subclinical uh, uh, flare of this kind of process. But in general, we feel that it's very helpful. We can simultaneously investigate both in both directions, right? There's no downside to getting the 
child physically moving to addressing their school issues and addressing their cognitive behavioral, uh, addressing their other sorts of problems that they're experiencing uh, while we're investigating if in fact there's a, a calprotectin that's increased and in suggesting an underlying inflammatory bowel condition. So, um, so again, that's a very important question. Those things certainly can coexist. Another example is sickle cell disease. Not to, to jump into that too deeply, but we know uh, that we can, even though there's acute flares of sickle cell disease, many patients with sickle cell disease have chronic problems. And we treat those in exactly the same way with a, a multidisciplinary biopsychosocial approach, because our perception is that those, that chronic pain is a complex phenomena that's not as simple as, as acute pain. Great, thank, thank you, Neil. Um, the second question I think Deirdre would be appropriate for you. This is a, a question from a, um, someone who works in a psychiatric hospital um, who is a pediatrician and who works with a multidisciplinary team of child psychiatrists, social workers, psychologists, OTs, and other therapists. They have uh, children who suffer from uh, different types of uh, pain, um, some sort of verging on conversion disorder. Um, in, and uh, the question, um, goes on, continues to say it's a challenge to help these kids manage their pain um, and uh, would like to know what the role of cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness is in helping these kids manage their pain. Absolutely, so hopefully some of what I've talked about so far answers some of that, um, but it's absolutely true. These, these kids, um, you know, often some of our more complex kids can have enough kind of psychological issues going on that it makes it kind of hard to help them engage in really focused pain treatment. And at the same time, they have so much physical impairment that it's hard to focus just on the, on the mental health piece. And that's really where we kind of lie is at that crossroads. Um, so I think the team approach, you know, the team you describe is a, a great team of people to try to be collaborating on those problems. I think the idea of, you know, the goal is improving function. Um, and that can be true, even if there's kind of a, a more, um, you know, functional neurologic kind of presentation to the pain issue. That's still what you're trying to do is get kids back to the things that they want to be doing. Um, you mentioned acceptance, mindfulness kinds of approaches, helping them um, identify, you know, what's important in your life. What, what have you lost in this experience and what do you want to get back to? And let's work together to try to find a plan that helps you get back. A lot of these kids, um, you know, have gotten very afraid of trying to do the things, even the things they used to love to do because it's been so physically painful. So helping slowly develop a plan to get back there um, is a, a big way that I think we engage some of those kind of behavioral techniques for those kinds of complex kids. Chris, you're muted. We knew that that was gonna happen at some <laughs> point. <laughs> it couldn't be a Zoom without someone forgetting to unmute. Um, so I, I think that, um, this is going to conclude our webinar. I thank everyone for uh, participating today. Um, and um, thank you for, for listening to, um, to all that we had to say. So thank you. Thank you. Um, also just want to note that there um, is some information in the chat for anyone who wants to refer a patient to our chronic clinic. Um, there's a phone number and there's a, um, an email address um, for you to, to write down.